welcome everybody to our uh, talks. Uh, first talk today is uh, Nicholas. Are we talking about uh, data agnosticism? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're running a little bit late from the uh, the uh, keynote. We're basically just going to shift everything by five minutes. Um, so same same timing and everything. But uh, yeah. Welcome and uh, all right. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, I'm Nick Kreidler. I uh, work for Creative Health uh, in Chicago, and I'm going to be talking about what I'm calling data agnosticism. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But uh, it's basically feature engineering uh, without domain expertise. So. Uh, First of all, to give you a little context about me, I consider myself to be a generalist. I um, am an applied mathematician by training. Uh, I, I focused on numerical solutions to partial differential equations. That's where I learned how to code. Um, now I'm working as a data scientist for this healthcare company. Uh, more recently, I've been involved in some Kaggle competitions and have reached their master tier. And then when I'm burn, burnt out from all of that, I play Final Fantasy Online. And there's a dragoon, which is pretty fun. So. Um, so I was formerly a defense scientist. I uh, did mostly data analysis, um, algorithm development, that sort of thing. Uh, wrote a little bit of C++ code here, here and there. But uh, for the most part, I've transitioned to Python at, at, after I left defense. I'm new to healthcare. I've only been with Accretive for about, about six months now. So today's talk is going to be, well, first I'm going to tell you a little bit mo more about what I mean about data agnosticism. Um, but then to uh, motivate all that, I'm going to talk about this uh, cattle competition to save whales from ship coll collisions. And then I'll use that to illustrate the, my data analysis process. And then, and then I'll talk a little bit about how Python impacted my work. And so if you remember one thing from, from today, it should be that responsible data analysis and quick iteration can produce really high-performing predictive models. Right? And, and I'll talk, talk about this more uh, in a bit, but, uh, but this is my main message. The, um, the other takeaway is that you don't need domain expertise. So as I said, I'm a generalist. Uh, I work on a variety of problems, uh, but I'm not a machine learning expert. Um, I'm certainly not a healthcare expert at this point, and I, I definitely don't have any experience uh, with whales. So, um, To motivate this a little bit more, there was this uh, data science debate at Strata last year uh, where the motion was in data science uh, domain expertise is more important than machine learning skill. And there were some great arguments on both sides of the fence, but one of the, the takeaways uh, was that if you have subject, subject matter expertise, you know which data and which features are important. You're allowed to f you, you frame the problem much more easily, and um, you, you get your high-performing predictive models from, from knowing uh, what exactly you need to measure. Uh, and then there was lots of talks yesterday that actually you know, added some more weight to this and talked about the difficulty of feature engineering uh, without domain expertise. But I think algorithms don't care, right? And so this way, this is what I mean by data agnosticism, right? The data, the algorithms, they, they take data in. They don't really care where it comes from. Uh, they don't know who generated the data. And, um, you know, they pretty much care about one thing. If you give me good data, I'll give you good output. And so if you have garbage in, you also get garbage out. And naturally, bad assumptions lead to a bad model. But the, the thing is, um, we can use models to help us find features uh, with, without uh, domain expertise, right? So we start out with a bad assumption and see how we fail, and from that we can iteratively uh, figure out how to make better models. And so uh, my evidence for this is the Kaggle competitions I've, I've participated in, uh, where I focused on feature engineering. Um, I don't have any healthcare or bioacoustics experience aside from you know, just recently working in, in healthcare. Um, but my uh, these were all team efforts, and my team uh, was a company I used to work at, uh, RTA Associates. We got 10th in the, in the Heritage Health Prize, um, and then the whale competition, and then the follow-on, uh, I worked with a former coworker, Scott Dobson, and we, got, we took first place. So, so I think the secret to my success was responsible data analysis and quick iteration, plus a lot of really bad ideas. But that's where the quick iteration part comes in. And so what I mean about responsible data analysis is that you, know, you should take some time to look at individual samples, not just the aggregates, right? See what's really going on in the data. Um, then also pay attention to sources of overfitting, right? So that, that is a danger from looking at the samples. You can see anecdotal evidence of things and maybe fit to that 
try to avoid that as much as possible. And that, that's where the skepticism comes in. So if you do a really good job, maybe you want to believe that you did something wrong and then be, be thorough and make sure that, that uh, whatever you're seeing is real. And then quick iteration. And so, you know, really domain expertise is just an advantage, a time advantage. And so if you can iterate quickly, you can reduce that time advantage. And plus, how else are you going to get through all those bad ideas? And so I'm going to talk about a uh, process for finding whales. Uh, this was the, the Kaggle competition, the North Atlantic right whale upcall detection. And they gave uh, about 80,000 uh, two-second audio clips containing a whale call. And the upcall sounds sort of, it's really low frequency, so it sounds, 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 like, sounds like a moo. But, um, but the goal was to determine the probability that a whale exists in that, in that clip. And they have this area under the curve metric that you're supposed to maximize. And so if you were to take a look at the forums, you'd see things about spectrograms and signal processing and audio and um, mel frequency, sepstral coefficients, things I know nothing about. Um, on the picture I, I've got is a, what a spectrogram is. It's a time frequency plot. Um, this is taken from the competition website. And then this sort of arc feature, this really bright red feature in the center is the up call that, that we're looking for. And um, they published a, a benchmark from Cornell University where the area under the curve was 0.72. So this to me sounded like a really cool problem because I never worked with whale data before and um, thought, thought, why not? And so you know, where do we start? Well, you could try Googling whale detection, but interestingly, it just leads you back to the competition website. And uh, then there are some papers, but they're, they're behind paywalls. So uh, didn't really, that didn't really work. Um, you could throw the whole thing into a random forest, which some people actually did, but, but what, what would you do after that, right? You, I mean, you, you might be able to pick out some frequencies that are, that are sort of important, but that's not really a model, right? So what I want to know is, you know, what can we do in just a few hours? And so I thought as a simple way to start, I would look at a correlation-based model. And so here I've taken the average of all the right whale spectrograms, and you can see in this sort of boxed out region that I have, there's this really strong arc feature that was um, similar to the feature that I showed you in the, the, the sample from um, the competition website. And so I thought, how well does that chip correlate with the spectrograms from the audio clips? Um, particularly, how well does it correlate with the right whale samples? We hope very well since this, this is the average of all of them. But then the, the non-right whale samples, the noise samples, how, how does that look? And so from that, I can generate three features. So this is the max. Uh, normalized cross-correlation. Uh, in red, I have the right whale clips, and in, in black, I have the noise clips. And then the corresponding locations of the, of the max, uh, the frequency and the, the time location. And so I thought, hey, that, that looks to be some decent separation. Let's just throw it into a random forest and see what happens. Um, you know, I, there's been a lot of great work. I mean, scikit-learn has been mentioned many times at this uh, conference. Um, and so, you know, random forests are quick high-performing and easy to interpret. In this case, I only have a little bit of data, so it probably, I don't know how much I can trust it, but um, it seemed to work pretty well. So how do we do? Well, it's a first pass. Um, I have the probability distributions um, for the, the right whale in red and the noise in black, and you can see there's some pretty strong separation. But the big takeaway is it gives you an area under the rock curve of 0.92, which is much better than Cornell's benchmark, right? So a simple model. Seem to seem to work pretty pretty well, but this was just the start, right? Uh, at this point in the competition, there was someone who was at 0.97 or something like that, and so the first thing that I always do in my process is look at what am I missing? Um, the the there's this sort of long tail in the red distri distribution where um, we're doing a poor job of of predicting the probability of a, a whale, and so uh, so I pulled some samples and. Um, I don't know if you notice anything, but uh, these are pretty noisy, right? There, you can sort of see the, the whale up call that we're looking for, but, but not really. And so the first thing I thought was, well, you know, these are some cases where I don't really have a strong like, signal to noise ratio. So what about some contrast enhancement? And if you do that, it pops out quite nice. And then I thought, well, does this make a difference if we go and do that same process again? So I've, I've got the, the max correlation again. And then the solid lines are this contrast enhanced um, feature. And then the dotted lines are, or the dashed lines are the original. And you can see that 
uh, the distributions are moving in the right direction. We've got the, the red, thick red line is moving further to the right, to the, I guess it's, you're right, and then uh, the black is moving to the left, and so you're getting more separation, and that gives you an area under the curve of 0.94. So we're getting there. And so I've mapped this to a cycle, and it, in the center is what I'm calling a, a good cycle, where I, I make a prediction, and then I evaluate that prediction, and then I figure out how I can improve my model. And I just try to do that in as small chunks as possible and try to get through quickly. And what I'm calling the bad is what I, a random walkthrough algorithm land. So, and I base this on um, experience working with others and then also some people talking on the forums where people pick an algorithm and it doesn't quite work. And so then they try another algorithm and it doesn't quite work. And then they try optimizing hyperparameters and then they're stuck in this loop of they, they've decided they're just going to use this one particular algorithm and, and then they, they try to make the, the, the most of it without ever actually looking at the data. And so I say don't get stuck in, in algorithm land. Focus on putting better data into the algorithm. Right? And so then I mapped all of uh, the examples I just showed you to this, uh, to the red cycle, and you can see I you know, chose an algorithm, we generated a model, uh, evaluated the model, and then figure out how to turn uh, whatever ideas we come up with as far as um, maybe making improvements into code. And, and the way that I can do that quickly is with Python, right? So the, the great thing about Python is I feel like it, it shifts the focus from algorithm implementation to data analysis. And so all of these great packages help me create um, a submission in like three hours or something like that. And so it's really due to all the great work that the people have done in this community. And so, um, so I, I always speak very highly of, of Python and I'm always trying to get my coworkers to use more of it. So, so from that, I'm able to, to do consistent uh, data-driven improvement just by constantly looking at, at where my model is not working. And uh, for the Heritage Health Prize, um, that was a very long competition. There were some, definitely some periods when uh, I burnt out and didn't work on it for very long. But uh, for the, the Whale Detection Challenge, it was a, about a two-month competition. And um, you know, after we made some pretty big jumps, sort of settled on a decent model, from there it was just you know, looking for um, ways to, 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 to improve. And um, I, I should mention that the difference between first and second uh, place in the World Detection Challenge was, I think, like five times 10 to the negative fifth. It was really, really small. And one of my features had a typo. Um, <laughs> so, so that made it even better. But, uh, um, but then there was this follow-on to the whale competition, this, this uh, right whale redux. And um, so I'll apply the same process. And I, I, I took my code from the previous challenge, got 0.987, which is sort of consistent with, with what I was seeing before. And then I looked at, at one of the ones that I was doing poorly at, and all of a sudden there's this, this junk at the bottom. Uh, these weren't in the, the previous clips. Uh, this data was collected with a, a different type of sensor, apparently. Um, and so I just notched it out and got first place again with, uh, <laughs> with uh, uh, the score of 993. And it's also interesting to note that, so after the, the first competition, I made my code publicly available. Um, someone downloaded it from GitHub and ran it, and they got second place. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, it was nice. So, so uh, in conclusion, you know, al algorithms really only care about better data. You know, and how you, you do that, um, you can trade computational time or data analysis time, but um, I mean, for the most part, you know, I didn't use really any of the, the expert approaches. Uh, I didn't look at audio enhancement or mill frequency, sexual co coefficients, zero crossing rate. Um, so, so I just tried to focus on what the algorithm was telling me uh, it was missing. And uh, so again, I say re responsible data analysis and quick iteration produce high performing bridge models. And here's the, the, the takeaway from the, the blog for, for um, Marine Explorer. Um, so that was, was really nice. And, um, let's see. and that, that's it. Um, here's my contact information in GitHub. Uh, if you want to see my Marine Explorer code, I mean my uh, competition code, it's all there. Um, and then also Accretive is hiring. So if you like machine learning and Python and all that stuff, uh, let me know and we can talk about uh, the great work that can be done in healthcare. We've got a few minutes for, for questions, so any uh
practice. When approaching a competition, uh, do you have any, do you think differently than if you were just like a work project? So the question was, uh, if I think differently when approaching a work project versus a competition, uh, not really. Uh, I, I apply the same process to my day-to-day -day work. In fact, um, that's how I started uh, the Heritage Prize. A bunch of us at work were like, you know, we always say that, uh, you know, bits are bits, and that is that. You know, we, we can uh, we can solve any problem. And so the Heritage Heritage Prize was sort of our example. Since we work in defense, like, oh, you know, we can do healthcare. Let's let's see how it goes. And we just did the same process, and the process seems to seems to work. Yes. Uh, I've been trying to use a forest uh, importance weighting for selecting additional features. You just use your own features and have to add any other kind of features. Um, so the, the question was if I use uh, random forest uh, importance weighting to, to select features, and um, yes, yes, I I, I tried um, some of the other things that people talk about in the forums. I always give a shot and um, they tend to not be very high on the list or they're very correlated with something that I'm already doing. Um, so. okay. Well, thank you. All right, thank you.